Hey, it's me. She's a former mayor. They're a former evangelical pastor with dissociative identity disorder. These two like to talk about the topics you're not supposed to talk about. They might cause you to perspire just a bit, but they'll definitely make you inspired. Let's talk religion and politics, and what spirituality and emotional well-being look like in a post-evangelical world. This is Paul and Ashley on Evangelicalish. All right. Welcome to Evangelicalish. Here we are. Here we are. Here we are. I always feel so grand after listening to that open. And you commented on it like every week. Well, but what I don't do that I really want to do is like air guitar, the fiddle sound or the violin sound. So <laughs> okay. you're at least getting, I'm at least controlling myself to not do that. You may be complaining that I always talk about it, but at least I don't, you know, start every show like this because I want to, but I don't. We're doing something a little different this week because actually right now at this moment, while this is airing, you are not sitting in your office upstairs in our house. Do you know where I am right now as this is airing? You're at a very I'm, high altitude. Uh, no, maybe, I don't know. I don't Mexico. think so. I'm in Mexico. Is Me is Me Mexico City at a high altitude? It's a very high altitude city. Yes. Oh crap! So so right now I'm out of breath, probably having a cocktail at a hotel bar. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Getting so, drunk faster than I should because I'm not comfortable with the altitude. Great. So, Ashley, being in Mexico City this week, we're recording. Uh, our parts of this. And I have uh, a podcast I recorded in the archives probably about a year ago that that somehow slipped through the cracks and didn't get played. And so we're going to play that for you today. And we'll introduce that in just a bit. But, but here we are. We can't help ourselves because like we just so enjoy like finding our way, me to the upstairs office, Paul to the downstairs and jumping on StreamYard and like recording a um, I don't know, an ish podcast. We really like this. So yeah. uh, we didn't go the whole week. And two weeks ago, what was going on? I think I could, oh, I had an event. I could make it. So you had to go solo. Then last week we had April on the show, which was wonderful. Yeah, that uh, was And we didn't want to follow up with another week of like, Ashley's gone and Paul is here. So, um, so we're doing, we're trying this like bending time and yeah. finding a way to still have a touch in moment with all of you and still air um, a cool episode. So welcome to all of you in the comments. And <sighs> I will be able to comment because I will be watching this as it's streaming live. So that'll oh, be, that'll be nice. That'll be fascinating. So, and I guess you could too in Mexico City if you so choose. Well, like I said, I'm going to be at the bar out of breath with a cocktail. So yes, <laughs> I could be on my phone saying hi to Doug on the left and to Pucky. And all of our amazing regulars that hang out with us live. Um, speaking of amazing people that we've met through this ish community, uh, we just had a fantastic lunch with Carol, who drove down from Sacramento. Uh, I'm not sure I didn't catch if she follows Pastor Paul or Ish or both. But anyway, just both. really cool, really cool person. And um, yeah, say say more about like why she was here and what we talked about. Yeah, she's uh, been a follower for a long time and a good friend. And sorry, my voice is a little messed up today because I'm just a little bit under the weather. It's not COVID. And it's not COVID. We did a test and <laughs> it came back negative for sure. And um, so, you know, we've we've been connected for a long time. Um, but I was selling an e-bike and she needed an e-bike. And so she bought my bike and came down from Sacramento to pick it up. And so it's always fun when you get to see somebody you've known virtually for a long time and then get to see them in three dimensions. And we had a lot of fun, ate some really good Fresno Mexican food together and had a wonderful conversation. The three of us getting to know each other, even though we knew each other already. You know, what's funny because, uh, and hopefully Carol's listening to this, and if so, hey to Carol. Uh, but what was really just wonderful and like, I don't know, heartwarming was sitting down, breaking bread slash tortilla chips because it's Fresno and that's what we do. Yeah. And um, 
And it's like, oh, you know, tell us your story. And like, you know, grew up in Assemblies of God Church. I'm like, so did Paul. Then I went to a Southern Baptist church. So did I. Uh, you know, how did you start your deconstruction journey? Well, it was Trump. That was that. I mean, it's just the stories are just so similar um, from, you know, from so many people. I feel like history, it's like we're living history right now. And history will will say this over and over and over again. There was just this sort of mass impact of this 2016 election bizarreness that carried on for years, including still now. Uh, well, but it was fun I, to just catch up with her. And I would say, like us, Trump didn't start our deconstruction journey. It was right. the, the straw that broke the camel's back. Or it maybe was for sure the, the straw. The bag of bricks that broke the camel's back that like, okay, we cannot be a part of this anymore. Right. Yeah. yeah. But um, anyway, and, so there are and, people go ahead. across the country, you know, like if you were just to see Carol at the grocery store and like, you know, just like a random person or she's a teacher in Sacramento, maybe one year, you know, your kids in her class, like you wouldn't know that this is a person who is, um, who's deeply spiritual and faith filled, uh, has strong convictions about her community, our country, our democratic systems, you know, and, and yet she has all, she has all of those things and is on a courageous journey. And imagine, well, I mean, you know, there's one, there's you, there's, you know, like, like there are, there are a lot of people who have this experience right now, who have the shared experience. And I think, I don't know, there's reason to be optimistic about that. And uh, yeah, I was, I was going to do the segue of speaking of Trump, we received our ballots in the mail. This we week. did. It, it was okay. So the California ballot book is like this thick. I mean, that's like, like newsprint pages, very thin. It is a very, very thick ballot. Um, so we got the, we got that a couple weeks ago and then we started getting texts from our secretary of state and our local, um, county, let's see, clerk, I think is the title of the yeah. election person. And, um, it was a very like, you should be getting your ballot. Here's about when, if you don't, you know, it's very customer oriented. I feel very secure in this. And then here they came. And um, I don't know if we have time to vote this weekend. It's, it's like probably an hour to sit down and kind of read through everything. Yeah, which we do every election and we read through it and we're like, okay, this is, we're, we're very judicious and civic minded in, in our voting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, I used to do a local podcast with a friend of ours and we had the head of the Fresno County Office of Elections on our podcast back then. And I was so impressed with the process of getting ballots out and getting them back in and counting and, and all of those things. And, you know, Donald Trump has made it very popular to say, oh, it's all a fraud and migrants are voting and all, you know, Kamala, Kamala Harris wants to, I, I don't know why they can't pronounce her name or intentionally. Oh, it is 100% intentional. Of course that's, it, it is a sign of disrespect and it is, you are so being dismissed, madam. It's just you being are an asshole then. Yeah. Okay. Of course it is. Um, you know, he's letting these people into the country because they're going to become voters for her and all of that stupid stuff. If you have anybody around you who, who ever voices that nonsense, Take them to your local county elections office and say, can you take us through the process for distributing and collecting and counting votes in our county? And you'll be amazed by the process. And so there's always, uh, you know, I just saw a meme yesterday about, oh, things you have to have an ID for, you know, I don't know what, you know, driving a car. Da -da 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 Buying this, this, Sudafed, you yeah. know. <laughs> All yeah. of those things, but you don't for voting, you know, does this make sense? Well, if you ever hear the process for voting and the fact that voting is a constitutional right for everyone, driving a car is not, then it's the government's responsibility to make it easy to vote. And if, what was I doing this week that, oh, I'm, I'm going to go back to school for my master's. I was filling out FAFSA and it said at the end, do you want to register 
to vote. Was it FAFSA? Something. I was I was filling out something, and at the end it says, you know, do you want to register to vote, or are you already registered, or whatever. We should make it easy to register and take away any barrier to voting. And then if you see the process that your county goes through to make sure that ballots are accurately counted, you would be so impressed and you would not be able to have any person in orange makeup or not to tell you that the election is fraudulent because it just is not. Do they make mistakes with in, a, in an individual precinct of a ballot or two? Maybe, you know, there's, there's a human process, but enough to swing an election? Absolutely not. Okay, so, okay, I'm thinking of so many funny things right now. I'm cracking myself up. Okay, so so just to recap, your suggestion is, if you have questions about your local process, your county office of counting, of administering the ballot, administering the election, you should call your county recorder or clerk or whatever the local title is and ask if there's an opportunity to come down or just show up at the front counter and ask ask someone to explain the process to you. And, and you're saying the person who did this on your local podcast a couple of years ago, and there's, believe me, there's nothing particularly special about the Fresno County Office of Elections. You're saying this kind of run of the mill person who was um, you know, in charge of all this, laid it all out with such precision that you're like, God, you know, we really do have tight processes around right. uh, administering an election. Right, and there are, there's lots of money spent to make sure elections are fair yeah. and the votes are counted fairly. That doesn't happen in these other things we're talking about, buying Sudafed and all of that. That's why you need an ID. But I'm just saying, if you believe it anywhere or you have people around you who believe it, say, well, let's go to our elections officials yes. locally just find and out. ask if they can tell us what our process is. and. Yep it starts to show you how it, it's not easy to fix an election. It's really not. It would take and a huge, huge conspiracy of hundreds of thousands of people. It's just and not possible. Our government systems are more transparent than not. So you can walk yeah. in and as a citizen of your of our country, you have access to information that's required by law that would be shared with you. Now, here's my comedic break on this topic. You mentioned Donald Trump's orange spray tan. Um, can we please do a segment on this show where we talk about my first spray tan? And can we can we produce the video of me going on camera, not realizing a lot of things about spray tans and um, sadly booking my first spray tan a day before I had to get filmed for this documentary that was being filmed and what that whole situation was. So let's just say after the election, when we're all just like hopefully punch drunk and happy for the uh, outcome, we should do a special segment on Ashley's first spray tan because okay. I'll say Donald Trump is not the only orange person around because <laughs> I had a lot to learn about a spray tan. Anyway. Okay. And, yeah. and, and by the way, along the lines of, of what we were talking about before the spray tan, I would say if you have somebody around you who believes there are schools in America where kids are allowed to use litter boxes in the classroom to go to the bathroom, call your local high school and say, are there kids using litter boxes in our schools? You know, do some work and find out if this is really happening, you know, and if it's your cousin's brother's friend's daughter's school in Hoboken, you know, or, or, you know, Oshkosh, Wisconsin, you know, call a school there and say, is this happening? Don't be an asshole about it. Just call and say, can I ask a question? Do you have litter boxes in your classrooms? By the way, and, did you, yeah. did Go you ahead. know that Hoboken is like a super hot market and like a, so trendy cool like we used to say hoboken like it was a out of the way place as kind of it is like now it's booming our daughter wants to live there like it's <laughs> anyway but you can still call the public schools in hoboken and ask if they have litter boxes the okay. point uh, the point remains yeah okay so why don't you tell us about the interview that um that you're about to play and uh then we can jump into it 
Matthew DiStefano is a co-host of the Holy Heretics podcast with Keith Giles, who has also been a guest of ours in the past. And uh, a while back, he wrote a book about the wisdom of hobbits and what we can learn today from hobbits. And uh, the uh, interview uh, I had titled The Wisdom of Hobbits and Heretics. And so let's hear from Matthew DiStefano. Matthew, good to have you here today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Paul. And where is Pastor here? Paul. For... Pastor Paul. Nah, you can call me Paul. It's okay. <laughs> I just play a pastor on social media these days. Oh, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> and where is here for you? Here is Chico, California, home of Sierra Nevada Brewery. Nice. Yes. I don't, I don't know if you if you're familiar with the area. Two hours north of Sacramento, in between in between, you know, Trump Country up here in rural California. Yes. Well, I I think I told you before I've done I used to do sports radio in Chico years ago yeah. from All right. down here in Fresno. So I know I know Chico pretty well. Pretty okay. well. I and I think uh Aaron Rodgers Yes, grew from up here, here right? went to Pleasant Valley High School and New College. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice. Well, Matthew is a co-owner of Choir Publishing and the author of The Wisdom of Hobbits and the Bonfire Sessions. I'm particularly intrigued by the Hobbit book, uh, which is out on Amazon and probably other sources that you can tell us where we can get it. Um, but for my folks who are listening who maybe aren't Tolkien fans necessarily, uh, what is it about the wisdom of Hobbits that drew you to write this book? Well, I mean, so many things. I think, uh, first and foremost, I see Tolkien as probably our greatest literary mind of the 20th century. And I think, and I, I make, I guess, a, a bold claim, um, but Tolkien heads would probably say it's not a bold claim, um, that Tolkien, the, the, the myth that he created is, I would put it up against the Christian and Jewish mythologies in the Bible. And I said mythology. I know I, I don't use it as an, <laughs> but it's not a pejorative or a slight. I, 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 mythology is how we tell great truths. It's how we, it's how we tell untruths as well. But um, I don't use it as a pejorative here. And I use it as a, as a compliment, right? And so where there's great mythology, I think there's great truths to be found. So I, I think there's plenty of wisdom to be found. If you're going to find wisdom in other mythologies like the scriptures, you're going to find it uh, with someone like Tolkien who created a fantastic one. I guess I can't go away from that just yet. Talk about how you see... Well, see the Bible as mythologies. That's not, that's going to be difficult maybe for some people to hear. Yeah. 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 So no, um, I, I knew I wouldn't get away that easily. <laughs> <laughs> so I, the way I approach it and the way I define the word, everyone's going to, I mean, we can define the word in many different ways. I take what's called a Girardian standpoint. So um, Rene Girard was a French literary critic turned anthropologist philosopher um, taught at Stanford and elsewhere uh, I was fortunate, actually, enough, it sounds terrible, to go to his funeral and attend his funeral and hang out with his family um, some years back. And so when I say the word mythology, I'm following his line of thinking. So mythology is how we how we tell our stories. I mean, that's super reductive, right? The way he views it is that the way we tell our stories is we generally paper over the myth of our victimization. So we, we paper over the truth of where the guilt and innocent lies in our scapegoating of others. And as a society, we do this really, really well. Uh, we, and, and the way we write our myths play out a certain way. We think of like Oedipus, the king, right? He's totally guilty of, of what he did with his mom and what he did mm -hmm. to his dad. And, and what happens is, is a plague befalls the people, right? And the plague doesn't go away until he goes away, right? So we get rid of our scapegoat. Uh, and and we we kick them out of the community, and then peace ensues. And so um, that's that's one way of viewing mythology. I think another way of viewing mythology is is the truths that are found in them. And whether they're pre-Christian or whether you're following the Jesus, you know, um, gospel message, which Gerard points out is like a it uses the template of myth and then kind of reverses where guilt lies, right? So we have now the innocent Son of God. Um, kind of exposing the lies that we tell of our mythologies. And a lot of people say, oh, uh, the Jesus story is really just um, a retelling of a bunch of rising and dying or dying and rising. I should put it in that order, right? Dying and rising gods or sons of God. Well, yeah, sure. But there's also a lot of um, subversion going on there too. 
So it's like using the template to flip the template on its head. And Gerard, I think better than anyone noticed this. And so when I'm, I'm talking about mythology in this very nuanced, very robust way, and then Tolkien, I think those stories, I mean, literally the mythopoetic stories that he has in there read like it's the book of Genesis almost. Um, and then he tells stories within that world that he built just like kind of the Bible does. So this very robust, very nuanced, very lengthy definition of the word myth. <laughs> okay, good. I like it. And, and I and I do want to get back to hobbits, but let me, I, I guess, in follow-up. So when you read uh, Jonah or Job or maybe you know, Virgin Birth, right. uh, do you look at those as mythologies and mythologies? Does it matter to you if they're true and real or not? Uh, yeah. So... Um... When you say the word true, I've got to say, I, I don't want to sound like Jordan Peterson because I'm not a fan. <laughs> <laughs> but we do have the we do have the default of did it literally happen in the way it's told in the scripture? Mm -hmm. And I would say I would follow more like Rob Bell and say that's a really boring, uninteresting question. Did did um, did Cain and Abel literally live and did one kill his brother? Uh, because Well, I don't particularly think so and i think it's a boring question the in the more interesting question is what is it what does this story say that's different or similar than the other stories that would have been around at the same time so one one uh example is romulus and remus and they have their two brothers this is the roman uh murder uh, yep. uh, uh genitive murder story uh they argue about how to interpret uh, a flight of birds and what what that omen meant and so they get in an argument and one kills the other and then one's the hero of the story and the city's founded off romulus right rather than remus so okay well that story existed so is the bible quote unquote plagiarized well no it's it's like it's using the template to say what is really different going on here and so then they tell their story and so when when i'm approaching any of the texts i'm not saying did this really literally happen in the way journalistically right i'd say that's such an uninteresting question like i i think there's a there should be a truth behind the truth right to, just like going to hobbits um i don't want to do your job for you and transition us sure but go ahead did, did frodo and sam literally live well no is that the end of our discussion how boring right so What's the truths found in fiction? What's the truths found in things that literally didn't happen? I think that's way more interesting because we're much more creative than we have to only talk about what's literally right in front of us. And if it's reported in a way that's wrong, quote unquote, then then it loses all value. I don't think so. Right. It's uh, I learned this. Uh, you know, of course, growing up, virgin birth was, you know, it was real. We knew it. It was true. Right, and, right. and then somewhere uh, along the line, somebody told me, you know, there used to be quite a heavy belief that Jesus was a bastard. And and the 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 religious guys even said, hey, Jesus, we know who our father is and as a as a pejorative of him. And yeah. And does it make the story any less interesting if somewhere along the line in history, somebody thought, well, we need to cleanse the story or our savior can't be a, a bastard and, mm. and our, and his mother can't be a, a, a slut, you know? uh, but yeah. does it make the story any less interesting? In fact, it almost makes it more interesting it does, to me. It does the op. I think when yeah. you whitewash it, it does the opposite yeah. and, and it turns the Jesus that you have to have, which is more of like a theological structure that you rather than a very human messy Jesus. And, and for me, give me the human messy Jesus rather than the whitewashed guy i cannot really relate to like yeah. this kind of superhero thing like well yeah cool for saving me and all that but you don't know what it's like to be me so you can't really talk about it yeah yeah i, I mean there's this place where jesus says this very racist thing to this woman you know and why can't jesus be messy like that and and attainable and and demonstrating you know this is this is how you live a better life by learning your way through this stuff so we take a break in this interview just to say, hey, we have a Deconstruction U gathering. A lot of people are looking for spiritual community. So I hope you'll join me in a Zoom gathering this Sunday, 5 o'clock Pacific, uh, to hang out together. And let me take a quick moment to say thank you to everyone who's downloading or who's listening live to the show. 
we really do love connecting with all of you. Thank you for making this possible for, for Paul and I to just hang out weekly and talk about our favorite subjects, religion and politics, and the direction of our communities, our country, all those things are topics here on ISH. But I'll tell you what, you know what? It's pretty cheap for us to do this, but it ain't free. And um, we need your support to keep going. Uh, that can look like something as simple as subscribing to this channel. In fact, if you haven't already, grab your phone right now, you're listening to my voice, do your little passcode, open up your screen and just hit subscribe if you haven't already, subscribe to this channel. And for those of you who really find this as a source of inspiration and something you keep coming back to, why don't you consider supporting us? It's uh, $5.99 a month and uh, it goes a long way to just pay the bills that keep Ish coming to you every week and to give us a little bit of support for um, for continuing to do this work with all of you. So appreciate you subscribing and supporting uh, and we'll get back now to our interview. Well, what if, what if um, you know, we talk about it in Christianity, uh, not to derail us, um, about the importance for repentance. So what if we had a Jesus who had to repent too? Because that to me is much more powerful. And I was also thinking, of course, I was thinking in relation to Tolkien, in, in, in Hobbit lore, to, uh, Hobbits come of age at 33. And it's tradition, I guess, Jesus died at 33. Mm -hmm. um, so to come of age is to like become an adult, right? When we come of age, we don't all of a sudden now have figured out all of adulting. Yeah. So if Jesus was coming of age, let's say, do you think, let's say Jesus didn't, didn't die at a cross and he lived to be 80, like the Buddha or something. Do we think Jesus would have grown and learned and changed his mind about something in 47 years of life? I would hope so. I mean, I would think, I think C.S. Lewis wrote about this, but I would, I would think he would. I've certainly learned stuff from the time I, I've only been around seven years after 33. So, and I've learned a lot and I hope to learn more. And I think Jesus would too. And, and so then we play this game of, well, Jesus was God. Oh, okay. So Jesus and, you know, didn't, why didn't Jesus say, stop having slaves? Well, he was human. Yeah. No, no, wait, you just said he was God. <laughs> you know, so yeah. we, we end up playing some silly games with that. And uh, I, I agree with you. I think a, a, a more messy story, uh, a Jesus that doesn't, that no crying he makes on the night of his birth is, is not an apprehendable story at all. No, it's not relatable. So I, again, yeah. like, let's just take it at face value. If it's a story, it's a kind of bad one. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I mean, if you a good story, you have to relate to the characters. Yeah, I, I do at least. Like, I have to. I don't care what happens in the story. I have to relate to the characters. And if I can't relate to a Jesus who comes out like preaching the word of God, not crying, like not burping, not far. You know, I mean. I, I, I'm hyperbolizing it, but you know what I mean. I hear what you're saying. No, yeah. I, and I, I do think he, I do think he pooped. I just think, I, it, yeah, I think it's a sure. part. I of changed a diaper too, like 13 years ago. So, <laughs> no, I, I changed a lot of diapers actually. <laughs> and, and so, tell us. I guess this is a good place uh, to tell us a little bit, bit about your journey that got you to the Hobbit book. What has your spiritual journey been like uh, over these last few years that has you thinking things like Jesus pooped? <laughs> well, I haven't thought about that in a long time until today, so I blame you. Okay, um, good. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I, I went through this whole thing that we now call deconstruction. I wrote a lot of books about God and theology. And then so how I got to a place was, I think I got to a place where I was comfortable where I'm at theologically. I don't have to have all the answers. I don't need to have um, an apologetic for my faith. I don't have to defend it to anyone. I don't have to explain it to anyone. So what do I now want to do? I want to write about hobbits because they're more interesting right at, at this point than theological matters. Um, but really, I, you know, I mean, my story could be anyone's story. And I, I wrote a book with my friend Michelle on it because I, I just wanted to have that, I guess, so I could be like, hey, this is my story. And it's interesting, I suppose. But it's, it's pretty common, too, right? You grow up conservative. You believe hell, inerrant Bible, gay people are going to hell, the rapture, on down the line. We've all heard it a thousand times. I'm curious. I'm philosophical. I went to, I went to university. It was a state school, but I still went to four-year college. You see the world. I loved philosophy. I excelled at critical thinking and all of that stuff. Um, so naturally, those things don't, <laughs> they don't really pair well with evangelicalism, <laughs> if we're honest. Um, so those things fall apart, like hell and inerrant Bible. Uh, why should I think that gay people aren't? 
quite as equal as non-gay people we're really going to rapture into the sky and there's going to be seven years i mean i'm not trying to make fun of anyone who believes that still today i'm just saying like uh, uh, upon critical reasoning and philosophical scrutiny it's just kind of weak Mm-hmm. And so I dropped all that stuff. And when I did, I asked a lot of questions and I asked them very plainly and bluntly and to my friends and to my pastors and then it didn't go so well. And, you know, my wife's grandfather was like a pastor of our church for 25 years and he was retired at the time. And, um, you know, so it caused a lot of turmoil, a lot, it caused a lot of family upheaval. I've now since come out by, which is that just doubled down on the Matt's going to hell stuff and leading everyone kicking and screaming with me. Right. That's how they view it. Um, and so, you know, I mean, the, we've, we've heard this, if you've talked to anyone who's quote unquote deconstructed, you've heard that story. It's something similar. Yeah. Right. And so that's kind of where I've been. And now I'm just, you know, I'm still writing. I still have interest in theology though. The only interest in theology I have is really like, how is this theology harming or helping people? Mm-hmm. And if it's harming people, how do we undo and untangle ourselves from the fear and the wrath and the, because I really do believe most people are better than their theology. So let's untangle ourselves from this toxic theology and get Christians to realize when they say God, they really mean theology most of the time. Yeah. And it, and it's generally, well, unfortunately too often in, in America these days, it's white Christo fascist or fascist adjacent nationalist adjacent yeah uh and uh, you know i only follow god's word well that's your interpretation no. of god's word no it's god's word like we no, believe no nope. i i keep asking people how how did you get so lucky to land in the one time in history where the church has it all exactly right or you even will you know Able you know, to I had, I had Calvinists who say if they were born in, uh, you know, uh, Mumbai, they would be Calvinists. So I'm like, here's <laughs> okay, man. I mean, okay, whatever. <laughs> uh, by the way, I'm a, I'm a proud CSU grad. I don't know if you went to a, a CSU school out here. Uh, I went to California state Chico. It to used to be like the top five party school. That was before my day though. Ah, you you missed out. I uh yeah, Apparently. CSU Fresno for me. They okay. they've decided now to call it Fresno State. So I guess that's, yeah, Chico State. Yeah, I guess that's what it is. But. All the same system, right? So we were rooting for San Diego State, and then they lost in the championship. And I know, but to it was kind of like, hey, this is kind of my alma mater. No, I'm just kidding, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's our it's our cousin at least. Yeah, our cousin. Yeah, maybe second, twice removed. I don't know. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Although if they go to the Pac-12, then they're not going to be our friends anymore. I but. guess not, right? Um. Yeah, so we go to sports there for a moment, but it's so I, what I hear then in your writings, uh, and and you talk about some universalistic principles, and and then to the hobbits, it sounds like there is still a philosophical search for a higher truth or a higher morality that's that's in you that that kind of spurs you and drives you a little bit. Is that true? Yeah, I mean, I, it, it's kind of trying to remove all of the as many suppositions as i can and just get to what is goodness as such what is truth as such and and that's what i'm trying to do whether it's talking about fiction i do want to write my own fiction Uh, i'm never going to not think theologically and philosophically but i think more of my philosophy and my theology is okay um let's take it down from the ivory tower and how do we get our hands dirty in the day to day and is this philosophy or worldview or politic political worldview, political philosophy, theology is impacting myself and those around me in a positive way or a negative way. And let's continue to reevaluate as we experience new things. So it's very, it's very what phenomenological, it's very first person oriented philosophy of trying to be present and learning new things and, and holding loosely when I come across, you know, I'm going to change my mind within the next, hopefully not too long here, when I come across new experiences and get challenged by new people and new ways of thinking crazy to think that how you believe should impact what you do yeah Uh, (laughs) well well whether it should or not it does yeah yes true true but to my my good christian friends who say jeffrey dahmer is in her in heaven and mother Teresa is not uh, i find that a little bit difficult to buy into yeah, well, everyone's so certain about that, aren't they? Yes, they are. Uh, and you in, it, it, you see this in, in Hobbits, although you're too tall to be one yourself, you say, but that there's a, 
I, I, I take offense to that. I just had I just had more Ent draft than Marion Pippen. I just kept drinking the Ent at the Ent. <laughs> There's a, a, a self-sacrifice that uh, in them that's almost, almost Christ-like, I guess. Maybe it, 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 you're positing to us in your book. Uh, yeah, I would. Um, I would. I would say it's that self-sacrifice would be more archetypal than like Tolkien trying to make an analogy, kind of yeah, like yeah. Lewis would with Aslan. And but the themes of self-sacrifice. I, I like that the hobbits are removed from like kind of if we think of like Boromir as being self-sacrificial, he's almost self-sacrificial, but for the sake of honor. And I'm, that's not to diminish that his interpersonal relationships, but that's how we a lot of like honor based societies would think of things where we sacrifice ourselves for like the greater good. And I, that's not a bad thing, but I like that hobbits are more like, oh, I, I self-sacrifice for literally just the people I'm doing it for. Like there's, there's no, like, I'm going to be, I don't think hobbits think I'm going to do this. And then they're going to write these great tales about me. I think mm -hmm. Sam would have never thought that way. It's kind of like, ah, shucks when he's called Samwise the brave, he's like, <laughs> you know, and a sincere kind of ah, shucks. And, and I like that, um, they do things almost just for the sake of doing them rather than for the tales that are going to be told about them later. And, and what do you think that tells us then? What, what wisdom can we glean out of that? I think they're just so connected with with the present moment. It seems like, like, and and if you think about it, like the the biggest joys in life are just the simple things when you're with your family and friends and community, and you're having a great night at the Green Dragon. If you drink, you drink. If you smoke, you smoke. Um, and that's so. That's why I they're not they're not worried about the pretenses. And it seems like w the way they view ecology, it's very allowing the cycles and the ebbs and flows of of the seasons and being in tune with what grows in your area and, and i think all of that is just being very in tune with your present place in life and not thinking about look, I, i'm not diminishing publishing or writing books or anything but a great quote is like uh, i'm gonna butcher it but the world is not in your books and maps it's out there and gandalf says that to uh bilbo and as a publisher i probably shouldn't say that right but it's true like <laughs> As great as our books, I'm, I'm not for banning books. Don't, 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 commit, don't take me out of context. Um, I'm definitely pro. -book. Well, you're not. You actually own a publishing company. I own a publishing company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'm trying to actually sell books here. Um, but, but in reality, the real, the real nugget of truth, the real like, this is what life's all about. I think is more just in the being present in the moment when you're not worried about um, having to write something down or thinking about something um, abstractly. It's just really being present. The world is right there in front of you. And I think hobbits really understand that they can also be insular and xenophobic and they have their kind of darker side. But, and I talk about that in the book too. I don't, again, the messiness, I don't, I don't mm -hmm. whitewash them and create some mystique about them. Like they're messy like us and they're messed up like us. And, and so Sam is such a, good character for us to kind of look at in that, you know, then it's, it's like, you're the only one who can do this becomes a, a really difficult place for him to be, I guess, in, in that, that he lives in this sort of village culture. And all of a sudden he is this one, again, savior and not, not a direct analogy to Jesus, but all of these great creatures need this little guy to, to help them. Yeah, and what's so interesting about Tolkien's characters, and I think why we're still talking about him and why we care so much, is that Sam is that figure, and Mary's that figure, and Frodo's that figure, and Pippin is that figure, but so is like Gollum. Like Gollum has his part to play too, and there's still pity and mercy for Gollum. And really, uh, I love how evil in Tolkien's world doesn't get destroyed by good; it almost des it destroys itself. And Gollum is a part of that. And what Gollum does, though he never intentioned it for good, it's still used. It still somehow ends up good because it saves Frodo and entire, you know, if Frodo left, Frodo, I mean, spoiler alert, doesn't throw the ring in. He actually would have left at that point. And I bring this out in the book, too. So it, I think it really helps, like, humanize even our scapegoats in society. And that's what Gollum is, really. Mm-hmm. Um, doesn't mean he's good. Doesn't mean he's trustworthy. Doesn't mean I want to have a beer with him, but he's still a human or 
in in Tolkien's world. He's still a hobbit. But the our our translation would be those that we detest and find gross and find icky are humans and they're humanized by Tolkien and that's where wisdom can be found. So who would our outcasts in society be? I'll mm -hmm. let you answer that for yourself because I don't want to, you know, I don't want, you know, I mean, I, I, we don't need to pile on, but we know who the ostracized people in our community are. And so it's not to say that homeless people or people on drugs or the LGBTQ community are golem, but people view them as a golem type. Yeah. So we need to rehumanize people who are human beings and we need to view them as fellow human beings. Matthew, I appreciate the time to come on and chat with us about all of this and tell us about the book, where it is and where can people find you out in the uh, social media world? Yeah. Uh, so the book generally, I mean, we're all online, right? So Amazon is easy. Um, it, but this book is at any retailer, Barnes and Noble, uh, you can get it on Kindle, you can get it in an audio book. Um, it is available. If, if you link in the show notes, that'd be cool. If not, you well, can just look up the wisdom of hobbits. Um, the, the publishing company is Q U O I R choir.com is our mm -hmm. website. And I'm on all the social media. As you said, I'm not on Twitter anymore. Cause why? Ugh. Like uh, I don't, I don't yeah. need to be on Twitter anymore. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm on all the other ones and, uh, yeah, you'll find me out there. All right. Love Matthew DiStefano. He's amazing. So now Ash, let's finish up. What's on your mind this week? You know, I um, I always have a range of things that I can like say honestly, something very shallow, something kind of deep, something in between. But I think what I'm gonna um, what I'm gonna say is on my mind this week. I started reading this book called The Autobiography of a Yogi, and uh, it came up for me in a couple different ways. All this, you know, when you have like those moments where all of a sudden everyone's like, "Oh, have you read this book?" Read this? So that happened for me. Apparently, this is a book that Steve Jobs would read like a couple times a year. Um, written in 1946 by a person who went on to become a very spiritual uh, figure in the, uh, actually lives in the U.S. or lived in the U.S. Anyway, it's just super cool. And like, it's kind of interesting to go on this, this like spiritual journey through the perspective of a different world religion than the one that I grew up with. Um, so I'm like kind of enjoying it. So that's not Yogi Bear or Yogi Berra. Who or uh no is from Montclair, New Jersey, where our daughter goes to grad school. Which we found out when we were lost trying to get to her uh last opera, and every street we turned on on the campus was called Yogi something, and we could not find our way to this theater. But anyway, no, not that. It's yogi as in um an Indian spiritual leader, uh and yeah, I think I'm saying I'm probably not saying the right words, but yes, as in, yeah, you know, you'll have to keep us a world religion on what you learn. Uh, what's on my mind is I had cataract surgery on one eye and am about to have cataract surgery on the other eye. And at a time when people don't believe in science, it's just mind boggling because I have a new lens. They like they just completely replaced the lens in my eye, not in my eyeglasses, in my eye. And they're going to do the same to the other one now. And the doctor is saying, and you won't have to wear glasses anymore when you drive or when you do basically everything except read. You're going to have to go to Walgreens and buy some readers. And at a time when we're like, no, science is evil and there's they don't know what they're talking about. I can go have eye surgery and get new lenses put into my eyes so I don't have to wear glasses anymore. I don't know what I'm going to do to not be able to, you know, accessorize with my glasses anymore, but I'm pretty excited to think about driving without glasses. I think it's going to be really like curious to see you totally without glasses. I wonder if it's going to make you look younger to not have glasses at all. Um, but you know what? It, it reminds me of um, Tom Cruise and uh, all of his Mission Impossible movies. And, you know, they like put the contact lens on that was like they could like type in information. and like, You know what I'm saying? Like when when I checked you out of the procedure, they gave me a little card that said, here's the information on the lens that we surgically implanted into Paul's eye. It was like, oh, my God, this is wild and crazy. Um, 
and so easy, right? Like, and if I take my glasses off now, my right eye is way better than my left eye. Yeah. And my left eye will soon get its upgrade. So that's pretty amazing. So in three weeks time, you will have had two eye surgeries and gotten braces. Yes. It is surely a season of renewal for, yes, it is. for all of you. <laughs> renewal is is good. Renewal. Um, all right. So coming up this next week, again, Paul's got a, a special session on Sunday. Be sure to sign up for that called Decon U. If you're just looking for a time to connect with other people who are on their deconstruction journey, spend some time with Paul. Um, that's going to be lots of fun. And the next week's show, we're not exactly sure yet, right? But we know it's going to be like election countdown and like keep our focus yep. there. Yeah, we're, we're, we're going to talk election till we get there and consort together and try to comfort each other as it's getting scary as we get close to November here. So I think maybe we do a little bit of WTF. How can it still be this close? And, uh, you know, kind of think about what what do we do to carry each other through this moment? All right. Hope you're having a great time in Mexico City. I'm I'm probably now what at least two cocktails in, so I'm sure I'm having a lovely time. I'll be sure to fill you all in next week. All right. Love everyone. We'll see you next week on Evangelical. See you soon.